Hello marine biology students. In this video, we're going to talk about fisheries and management. So clearly, fisheries have been overfishing in the past. To learn more about this and also how they might be managed, we need to understand some concepts about optimal yield and population growth. Marine species are renewable resources. But in order for a fishery to last indefinitely, it must be fished in a sustainable way. The sustainable yield is the amount that can be caught from a population and yet still maintain a constant population size. Now, at first guess, you might assume that any sort of collecting from a population would result in that population size going down, but that's not exactly the case. If you have a very large population, the population growth will actually be reduced due to competition within that population for resources, for space, and for other materials. If that large population has individuals taken from it, it will actually allow for rapid growth to replace those lost individuals. Keeping the harvesting of a population in that range where it can replace those individuals which were collected is the ideal area. This is the sustainable yield, and a fishery that stays in a sustainable yield will last indefinitely. The maximum sustainable yield in business terms is the ideal because that is the highest catch that can be maintained year after year without affecting the stock. Maximum sustainable yield would result in the highest profits on the business side of things, and yet allow that population to not start being depleted or going below its replacement size. If catches fall despite increased fishing effort, then overfishing has occurred. This means that even if you increase your fishing effort, but you do not catch more fish, you are overfishing this particular population. Now market forces. The laws of economics often cause this to happen because if fishermen are making money, then other fishermen will be attracted to the fishery and cause overfishing to occur. The long-term survival of a fishery should be the goal both of the fishers and of the market and of the managers, and it often is. But when some individuals start collecting more fish, they get more profits, and yet the cost is distributed to everyone else. And so, in strict terms of capitalism, there is often little reason to restrain from collecting as much as you can for yourself before stock is depleted, and unfortunately, that results in this overfishing that has been seen again and again. It is estimated that about 70% of marine fishes are already overfished. This is especially true for large species like tuna, swordfish, and sharks. In many of these species, the fish that are harvested today are about half the size of those that were harvested 20 years ago. As one example, big eye tuna were two times as heavy and eight times more abundant in the 1950s than they are today. In the swordfish fishery, catches fell 70% between the 1960s and the late 1990s. And this wasn't due to lack of effort. Remember, this effort was probably increasing three to four times what it had been. 
a campaign to reduce consumption of these fish has been successful and we've seen that some swordfish populations are recovering as we've reduced some of this pressure on them. Other dangers to fisheries include not just the depleting stocks of fish, but also habitat destruction. Especially if this habitat destruction happens at critical breeding grounds like seagrass beds. Estuaries and mangroves that are being rapidly destroyed. This is especially detrimental since 75% of commercially important species use estuarine areas. As nursery areas, another very damaging fishing practice is that known as bottom trawling. And that's because these trawls damage the ocean floor, which is detrimental to demersal and benthic species. A fishery is regarded as collapsed if numbers fall to 10% of their historic highs. It is estimated that one third of fisheries have already collapsed. A recent study has indicated that all major fisheries will collapse by 2050 if protective measures are not taken to better manage and protect these resources. Now this isn't all bad news because some of these protective measures are working, yet it's not easy. Management can be difficult for many reasons. This is because one, the maximum sustainable yield is a difficult number to calculate. How much can you take from a population and still allow that population to recover in size? Well, how much food is available this year? Are there any reasons this year is different than previous years? What has the catch been and what has the mortality been? These are all pieces of information that you need to get an accurate answer here. And a lot of times those numbers are simply unavailable or prohibitively difficult to obtain. Sometimes your understanding of a species and its method of competing with other species takes into account its current population size. But if the harvested species population size falls, that harvested species may not be able to compete with other species as effectively, and that may mean that population may not rebound as quickly or replace the numbers that were expected. It also turns out that real fisheries are more complex than the models that are used to predict them. Another difficulty is that the high seas are common property. And rules of regulation of one country that fishermen might follow may not necessarily prevent fishermen from other countries from collecting from that common area and thereby depleting the stocks. Another difficulty is that fisheries often underreport how much they've collected. And so if the managers are trying to figure out the population size and its ability to rebuild, their estimations are only as good as the data that they use. So what are ways to limit a fishery? Well, one, you can declare a certain catch that can be collected from an area, and you can close that fishery. Once that catch is met, another is by controlling the length of the fishing season that is allowed. Another is by determining which areas are open for fishing. Again, it's not that fishing of any sort needs to be banned, it just needs to be managed. Other ways to limit a fishery is by limiting the number of boats. 
that are permitted to fish, the type or the size of the fishing gear that's used, the allowable size of the fish that are caught, the number of catches that are allowed per boat, are also limiting the fishing methods. Here in this image, we can see the effect of using nets with three different mesh sizes. In the first size, all fish are caught of all species. In the second one, fish of the smaller species, the sardines, they are allowed to go free, whereas the larger fish are kept behind. If the mesh on that net was even wider, it might allow only for the harvesting of the largest of individuals from that population. And so that would allow the younger individuals to continue to grow and reproduce. Now it all depends on the population you're working on, because sometimes it's the larger individuals that are hundreds, even thousands of times more reproductively successful than the middle-sized individuals. And so maybe it's the middle-sized individuals that should be collected. In 1996, the U.S. Sustainable Fisheries Act was passed, and this Sustainable Fisheries Act required federal fisheries managers to develop plans to avoid overfishing, to restore depleted stock, to reduce bycatch, which are organisms that are caught that are other than the targeted species and often have little to no commercial value and end up getting dumped back into the ocean, usually dead and dying. This act required all fisheries to be managed in a way that they would be sustainable, that U.S. fishermen must abide by the rules as well as foreign fishermen with valid permits who are fishing within the U.S. The Pew's Ocean Commission also calls for management of ecosystems in addition to just fishery stocks. Another way to manage fisheries is by developing new fisheries. These new fisheries may be developed by increasing the use of discarded bycatch. While some of these species may not be appealing to customers, some species like pollock may actually be used in making different types of products such as surimi or imitation crab. Other untapped potential fisheries include some species of squids which are found in high abundance, flying fish which are not regularly fished at this point, and also lanternfish. of the mesopelagic. In fact, these lanternfish might be one of the largest untapped fisheries at this point, and if they are harvested in a sustainable way, their populations would be able to replace themselves, and many of the current industrial practices that use clupeoid fishes might be just as effective using lanternfish. Aquaculture is another method of trying to help protect native populations. Aquaculture is the application of farming techniques to the growth and harvesting of aquatic organisms. The term mariculture applies specifically to the culturing of marine organisms. Now, the number of marine organisms harvested through mariculture has risen threefold since 1990. As an example, farmed shrimp now account for 25% of all annual consumption of shrimp. Now this is great in some ways, but shrimp farming has its own impact on the environment and so needs to be done in a properly managed way. Other farm species include milkfish, mullets, Atlantic salmon, seaweeds, abalone, and scallops. Here we see a chart showing some of the commonly raised both freshwater and marine organisms through aquaculture and mariculture. 
The fish include things like salmon and cod and flatfish, milkfish, mullets, and even efforts going into raising tuna. There are also many mollusks that are raised, such as abalone and clams and mussels and oysters and scallops. Shrimp are the most commonly raised crustaceans, and there's also mariculture of seaweeds. Here we can see a floating pen holding milkfish, and you can see the fishermen and their catch. There are some problems with aquaculture and mariculture. The first is that of disease and parasites. Because these organisms are often raised to such high densities in such small areas, that disease and parasites can easily spread. Another difficulty of mariculture is maintaining water quality. There can be eutrophication. due to uneaten or excess food and also the waste of the organisms that are being grown. Also, unfortunately, mangroves. And other estuarine communities are often being destroyed to create ponds for farming shrimp and fishes. Additional problems with aquaculture could happen if farm species escape because they may breed with wild stocks and dilute the genome of those wild populations. Pollution from farm ponds can also leak into nearby waters. Some of the difficulties in aquaculture is that sometimes there are different food requirements. that are needed by these organisms as they are raised through their different life stages. And also, there are simply difficulties. When it comes to farming, open water species. Now, some of the other reasons why marine organisms are harvested include commerce and recreation. Mangroves can be chopped down for timber and charcoal. Pearls, shells, coral, and sea turtle shells are used for jewelry and fashion. With tortoise shell being commonly used in glasses and other decorative items. There are some species that are harvested for chemical compounds that can be used as marine natural products. Amateur anglers are another way that marine resources are used. They can be caught by recreational fishermen, and this ends up being about 30% of the amount caught by commercial fishermen. The number of individuals of some species caught each year may be solely from recreational anglers. Another way that marine resources are used is through the aquarium trade. They are harvested from natural environments and sold worldwide in aquarium and pet shops. Since aquarium organisms must be alive in order to be marketable, often hundreds of individuals are collected and die before reaching market for the few that actually make it there. There are non-living resources collected from the ocean as well. Things like oil, and gas, sand and gravel, salt, desalinization for fresh water, tidal and wave energy, and polymetallic nodules. which might be collected in the form of undersea mining. In this image, we see an example of a power generator that uses tidal energy. And in some ways, this might be a great source of green renewable electricity. But in other ways, this needs to be held back by a structure much like a dam. And that totally changes the dynamics of the coastal region 
around these power plants in order for them to be effective. Now, it's not that nothing good can come of it, but the costs and the benefits need to be weighed for these types of projects. And that takes us to the end of our discussion of resources that we get from the ocean. Now, before our next video, I want you to think, how good a job do you think humans are doing in taking care of the oceans? We'll talk about that next week. See you then.